everyone welcome to our last series for Dying to Know Day um, on safeguarding your rights today. Uh, we have two great presenters, but first I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. We respect their continuing culture and contribution to this city. Um, we pay our respects to elders past and present and would like to extend this respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders attending today or watching the future recording. Um, we'll be chatting with Alicia Hine today and Anne from the Advanced Care Planning te Team. So Alicia will be first up and I think you've got a really great introduction in your slides so I won't take too long going into that. Um, but really excited to hear about LGBTQIA plus inclusive care. So I'll hand over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Darcy. Um, I will, I'm sharing correctly. Can someone just confirm? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to echo the acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd like to add to mind that sovereignty was never ceded and treaties have never been signed in this country as well. Um, so, um, as Darcy said, my name's Alicia. I'm a registered nurse, um, a academic and also a PhD candidate um, at this point in time. That's just a few of my little, I wear a few hats. Um, so I guess I wanted to come into the topic um, just introducing uh, who I am and why I want to talk about this kind of thing. Um, I think it's important to understand um, the perspective people come from when it comes to these kind of conversations. Um, so my background is registered nursing. I've been a registered nurse for 13 years um, and I specialised in aged and end of life care for that entire time, um, mostly working in aged care facilities. Um, I'm now a lecturer and I also look after placements with, within um, nursing at UC. Um, I'm doing my PhD at University of Wollongong. Um, and what I'm looking at in my PhD is a lived experiences of older people, um, LGBTQAI plus um, older people um, in aged care facilities and in aged care services in the community um, around Australia. Um, I've been working with the LGBTIQ plus health, um, used to be Health Alliance, um, on a national palliative care project as well, which is, um, I can give you the links at the end um, for what's happened in that space already, um, and also working with the um, Australian Association of Gerontology in that space. So I was approached by Palliative Care ACT to assist in bringing together a toolkit um, which is more specific to the care of LGBTQIA plus people um, at end of life. So they've put together a few toolkits over the last three years um, around uh, cultural competence and also end of life care in the workplace. And so this was the next topic that they decided they wanted to have a toolkit on um, and asked me to help with that, which I was very um, honoured to do. When I was bringing that toolkit together. I worked with Meridian here in the ACT um, and also the LGBTI Health Alliance as well. Um, and I'm also a queer person myself. So I have lived experience, um, which makes me passionate about this, this kind of topic as well. So um, I'm trying to just pick a few things from the toolkit because obviously I've got you know, only 15, 20 minutes. So I just wanted to pick a few things that I thought were really important. Um, and then I guess um, field any questions from what people actually want to know around the topic as well. So um, coming into this, I think it's important to acknowledge that most um, people in LGBTQIA plus communities have experienced some kind of institutional um, and or societal discrimination and abuse. So that's not historical it is historical obviously but there's it happens daily um in the current day as well i think um there seems to be still an assumption that because um there was a marriage vote that everything is better <laughs> um but people still face things um on a daily basis and particularly people within trans um and gender diverse communities as as far as when it comes to legislation and things like that um, our healthcare and other formal structures and society in a whole are still predominantly um, use heteronormative, cisgendered and mononormative language. So that just means that everything that we kind of talk about 
um, the language that we use, the information that's on forms is all like skewed towards assuming people are heterosexual, um, that they're, uh, as they um, assist gendered as well, which talks about them um, identifying with the gender they were assigned at birth and also mononormative, so saying that people are monogamous. So there's all these assumptions that this is what people in society are. Um, and this tends to be one of those big kind of barriers when it comes to um, engaging in really formal structures, but even in society on a whole. Um, there's also a lot of uh, people that have had either past personal experience or from hearing from other community members, um, bad experiences in healthcare, um, people then delay actually seeking healthcare when they need it. So obviously when we talk about um, palliative care and also end of life care, there's a lot of stigma um, and um, people don't talk about death a lot in our society. And so those things kind of impact on people already not seeking care um, when they probably need it. So that means people aren't getting care until they're um, actually a lot sicker. Often they don't have as many options when it comes to um, the kind of treatments that they might be able to be provided. Um, and also it means that a lot of people are managing symptoms that can be managed better. Um, they're trying to manage them at home as well. Um, from the research that I've done so far, the, there's a lot of stories about people that um, would prefer to not have to engage in healthcare. And so they kind of have their own strategies around how they're gonna manage things at home, um, which is a pretty harrowing kind of thing to think about as a nurse, um, because I think, you know, of the things that we can provide to people. And if people are then trying to manage these things at home um, without the resources or necessarily the knowledge, um, then it's definitely gonna be worse outcomes for them. So, Stemming from what I've um, just talked about then, inclusive language is what's really important when it comes to providing an inclusive space. Um, often our first interactions with someone is where everything falls apart. So if you think about the kind of language that you're using when you're interacting with someone for the first time, what kind of questions are you asking? Um, often in healthcare, what are the questions on the intake form? Um, or what questions are you guided by assessments to ask um, when someone first comes into your care? We talk a lot about building rapport in healthcare. So as nurses, it's always about building rapport with a patient. How can we build quick rapport with someone? And often that, that comes undone really quickly from simple language that's used um, when filling out intake forms um, or just having those initial conversations. The important thing to recognise with inclusive language, and I think this comes up a lot in um, if you engage in social media, um, talk, people worry that, you know, being more inclusive takes away rights from everybody else. And it really doesn't. And it doesn't actually exclude anyone by using inclusive language. It's not asking people to directly out themselves either. Um, or directly asking about their sexuality or gender necessarily, but it's just about making sure that your language doesn't assume things about those uh, the person in front of you. So in the toolkit, it actually talks about um, assuming that somebody is LGBTQIA+. And that sounds kind of radical, but I think if we think in that way and our language is more open, then we're more likely to... Um, provide a safer space for people and it's not going to exclude people that are heterosexual or cisgendered um, it's just going to make sure that other people are also included in the conversation so I've put some um, actual tips for questions here because I think sometimes people um, when things like this happen they go but what can I actually do how do I actually put this into place um, so there is this is within the toolkit as well. So just asking what someone would like to be called. It seems really simple, but often we use legal names that are written on forms um, and that, that alone can be enough to get someone um, upside or feeling unsafe. So just asking what someone would like to be called. It might be someone's legal name. It might be not. It might be a nickname and that's not exclusive to LGBTQIA plus people. That's everybody. Um, I've worked in aged care most of my life and most people don't go by their legal name. Um, most Margaret's are Betty or something like that. So it's not, it's not a particularly different thing to ask, but sometimes we do forget. 
Um, asking about pronouns is also really important. We all use pronouns. Um, it's it's not just trans people or non-binary people that will use pronouns. We all use pronouns. Um, so important to just make sure that you're using the right ones for that person that's in front of you. Um, asking about important people and family, it's really important that we don't assume people have partners. Um, we don't assume people are in touch with biological family. Um, it's it's important to kind of say, who are important people? Who's at home with you? Um, who do you live with? This is something that we actually teach when we're talking about paediatric nursing because we've been taught not to um, assume people have a mum and a dad at home and so that the child doesn't feel that they're missing something. You know, this is something taught in paediatric nursing, but it's important for everybody that we don't assume who's at home with that person. So asking who someone's important people or family is um, rather than just assuming that someone has a partner or a biological family. Um, and also asking who's available to help when someone's unwell, because that might be very different people to the person's um, initial important people that they're talking about. Um, so this might be more around who someone lived with or who has capacity at the time as well. Um, I think it's important to also acknowledge that there's huge intersections um, in minority groups and a lot of people um, might have disability or the, their important people might have disability as well. So important to think about um, people that are actually available to help um, at home if somebody is unwell. Um, this next section is just talking about what's important for the community itself. So thinking if there's anyone, I'm not sure who's in the audience, so um, just thinking if there's anyone that identifies as LGBTQIA plus in the audience, um, thinking of things that you might need to um, know or advocate for if, if you're coming into an end of life journey yourself. So um, some of the questions this can be not just for end of life care, but also for any kind of health care. But thinking about what you're actually comfortable with in a healthcare situation um, before you're in that space, because often we're even more vulnerable when we um, come into healthcare, and especially when we're talking about end of life, um, we're facing our own death and things like that. It's really important that we've maybe thought about um, the comfort of these kind of things in healthcare before then. Um, so one of them is around if you need physical care. So thinking about who you might be comfortable with giving you physical care. So this might be around, um, uh, it might be around the person's, sometimes it's around the person's gender, people are more comfortable. Um, and this is not, but again, not e exclusive to LGBTQIA plus people. Um, people are sometimes more comfortable with someone of their own gender, opposite gender, um, sometimes, um, it can be about the person's lived experience as well and how accepting they are of you as a person um, in the comfort that you might have with them in if you're needing physical care. Thinking about what gender and sexuality affirming practices um, do you wish to continue when you're nearing end of life and even after you've died? Um, I've, I've read some harrowing things around people facing end of life um, and being buried then by their family as um, not as their gender, but as their gender assigned at birth. Um, so family not respecting that after the person's actually passed away. Um, but even in end of life journeys, thinking about um, end of life's not necessarily, you know, days and hours. We could be talking about palliative care, you know, a year or even two years before somebody passes away. So thinking about things like hormone, um, treatments and also um, thinking about if you're not able to dress yourself anymore, um, what kind of things are going to be really affirming for your gender and sexuality as far as when other people are having to control some of those things for you. Does your current healthcare provider do these things? So if you're already engaging with a healthcare provider, I really hope everybody has a GP. Um, and if we can get a regular GP, that's probably the best thing for anybody in a healthcare journey. Um, but are they doing these things for you already? So if you're already facing um, your healthcare team not respecting these things for you, then this is when, when you're, you know, well um, and not facing end of life is a time to really find a healthcare team who is going to respect these wishes for you. Um, 
who can ask hard questions for you when you're unwell? So is there a family member, a special person, an important person that can actually ask questions for you when you're feeling really vulnerable? Um, is there someone that's able to advocate for you in that space? Um, or do you need formal advocacy as well? So that's something that it's going to be might be really important for you if you don't have um, a strong network. Um, would you feel more comfortable if your loved ones are present when you're having personal care um, or if you're receiving physical care? Um, and is there legal documentation that you have um, to make sure that your important people are respected? So I know that there's going to be um, talk later about advanced care planning, which is part of that process, but also thinking about um, the legal documentation around um, power of attorney or guardianship, depending on your state and territory. Um, this is something that changes as soon as you cross borders as well. So making sure that your documents are in place for where you are at the time. And also thinking about who you don't want to have access to information. It can be really important um, for your healthcare team to know who are those people that you don't um, want to have access because often there is still assumptions around biological family and people being given information that are biological family. And if you particularly don't, there's people that might try and ring in access um, and ask for information. It's important that you've kind of identified that with um, your healthcare providers as well. Um, so there's, there's lots more in the actual toolkit. So that's a link there for the toolkit. Um, it's a completely online resource. Um, there's also some really good information um, at the lgbtiqhealth.org. Um, org. Um, so that's the National Palliative Care Project. So there's some resources there already and we're um, developing more as, as we go. So that's kind of been a year long um, almost two year long project now. So um, there's been a lot of consultation with community in that project, which is really important to understand um, how community are feeling about palliative care that's provided or that's available as well. Um, there's also, uh, or ACON also has a um, page that talks about um, palliative and end of life care. And it talks about everything from um, legal kind of considerations to these kind of conversations that I'm talking about um, with healthcare providers um, and also thinking about who your networks and supports are. So I'll leave it there, but absolutely happy to answer any questions from anybody um, around this kind of thing. Thanks, Alicia. Um, we haven't got any questions in the chat. Did anyone want to jump in with some questions? If not, I have got a question here. Um, so just from Eventbrite, do you have any tips for consumers who are nervous about discussing their sexuality or gender with a new health practitioner or care provider? Um, it's a really difficult one. And I think it's, um, you can kind of suss out organisations before you engage with them. Um, so, you know, thinking about um, the internet is a great resource. <laughs> for finding out whether organisations have actually participated in um, training. Um, there are, you know, there's accreditation programs like the Rainbow Tick, but that's quite onerous and expensive for organisations. So um, it's just often you can suss out whether organisations have some kind of um, inclusion policy, whether they've engaged in training in that space. Um, yeah, that's the kind of thing I'd, I'd say first is actually kind of do a little bit of squirrelling about the organisation that you're going to um, attend, um, if possible, one that you know is going to be a safer place. But if you're faced with having to go somewhere else, I guess it's um, thinking about what supports you have as well. So thinking about those informal supports such as family, take someone with you, absolutely. Yeah, so if you can take someone with, and that's why I say if there's someone that's well that can ask those hard questions for you um, that can be really helpful but it is about a continuous um, coming out process for people on a daily basis which is really difficult so I think that's why if we can emphasize um, healthcare actually being more inclusive in language it, it becomes easier if we know that the person's going to receive that. 
Thank you. Um, and I guess also on the organisation side of things, what are some kind of visual cues that can be there to kind of signal inclusion? Like you mentioned, you know, you could do your own research as a consumer looking at training, but what are the things that the organisation can put out there themselves? Yeah, so um, we talk about this a lot in nursing because I think often it's a it's a really quick vid visual cue that will let someone know that you are a safer person. And I say safer because we can never just, we can't guarantee complete safety for everyone. So I, that's why I use the safer rather than safe. Um, I must say for myself, when I've gone into a healthcare setting as a consumer, if I've seen that someone's got a little rainbow on them somewhere, I'm I'm more assuming that they're going to be open to conversations um, about me being authentic, more authentic in my identity. Um, so lots of people will have, you know, little rainbow uh, badges and things like that, which can be really helpful. Um, organisations, I've seen more organisations using the flags within um their you know letterheads or their email signatures um people actually using their pronouns in their emails um in their in their web um kind of meetings and things like that showing that you understand why it's important for you to share your pronouns so you make it more comfortable for other people to share theirs um it it really can be really small things that makes a huge difference um and i also think yeah, I, I kind of think about this with my students too. So I often, when I'm teaching, I wear a little rainbow badge. So, you know, the students will know that um, I'm open to having conversations about those things as well. 